In 1970, he became director of the Fritz Haber Institute of the Max Planck Society in Berlin, earlier known as the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Physical and Electrochemistry. He's presently a director of the Department of Physical Chemistry at that institute. His research areas and activities are well known to electrochemists throughout the world, and they include such areas as electrochemical kinetics, fast reaction kinetics and solutions, electrochemistry of corrosion, the electrocatalysis area, and semiconductor and photoelectrochemistry. His positions include the, being the past president of the Bunsen Gesellschaft for Physikalische Chemie, and also the, Insti the International Society of Electrochemistry. Uh, Professor Gerrisher has honorary degrees, honorary doctorates from the University of Southampton and also Erlangen in Germany. He holds the 1976 the Bunsen Prize of the Bunsen Gesellschaft and in 1977 the Palladium Award of the Electrochemical Society. His uh, activities have included uh, serving as uh, honorary professor at the Technical University and the Free University of Berlin. He has been a visiting faculty member also in this side of the Atlantic, including a visiting faculty member at Berkeley at the University of Florida at Gainesville and a Fairchild a lectureship and visiting scientist position at Caltech. It's indeed a pleasure to present to you Professor Garisher, whose topic this afternoon is semiconductor electrodes theory and experiences. Professor Garrison. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a very great pleasure and honor for me to give this year the LTEC lectures at this university, which is so world known for an enormous intensity and efficiency in electrochemical research. And I have already enjoyed not only the hospitality, but also the activity of all these groups. And I see uh, I shall be well entertained for these two weeks with science and also other uh, events. Now, uh, I have chosen this subject for this for general lecture because uh, it is, last at least, my particular interest has been in the last years. And I think there is a good reason uh, that one uh, is fascinated by semiconductor electrodes uh, from a mainly fundamental point of view, because uh, this gives us uh, much easier access to correlations between solid state properties and the reactivity in electrochemical systems much easier than with metals. And that was the point which fascinated me when I came across the first papers of Bretton and Gerrit in 1955, where they studied germanium. And then I had the idea that is the system to be investigated also. Uh, that time, it was difficult to get any of these materials. Now, my and my intention is to cover in this lecture mainly three parts. Uh, first will be a, a representation of the properties of the semiconductor electrolyte interface. Then I want to discuss electron transfer reactions at such interfaces. I shall not discuss reactions with ion transfer because that will be the topic uh, of my lecture on Monday because usually these are irreversible processes which uh, destroy the semiconductor and lead to corrosion. And, uh, uh, but uh, one of the important applications, or at least the hopes for application, is the particular behavior of semiconductor under illumination where you can really 
measure and uh, follow reactions very far from equilibrium. And so far, it's also a unique property of these semiconductors. So I shall, in the third part, talk on photoreactions and, if time permits, a little bit on the attempts of using these systems for the conversion of solar energy. But I shall do this very briefly. Now, could I have the first, oh, I think it's self-service. I hope it will work. OK. What happens if we bring two phases in contact, which both have electrons available the, and uh, both uh, can be characterized by uh, electrochemical potential of the electrons, which can be expressed in terms of the work function. Now, if we do it with a metal, and we bring it to contact with a redox electrolyte, electrolyte containing a redox system, where the redox potential controls the electrochemical potential of the electrons. And assuming here that this here has, the system has a higher electron affinity, the higher work function, what happens if you bring it to contact? Now, then electrons have a higher energy in the metal that will flow to the redox electrolyte, some species in the reduced state. And a double layer will be formed, which adjusts the, equal, the electrochemical potentials of the Fermi levels in these systems, which is an equivalent expression for the electrochemical potential, to the same level. And if we keep the energy scale in the electrolyte as a reference, then it means this goes down because now the uh, have now a positive charge, excess charge here and negative here. And this difference, this, this uh, change in the potentials, occurs at a very narrow range, and you will know there is a Helmholtz double layer with a tension of a few angstrom. If you do the same with the semiconductor, and assume that the semiconductor has not a two high concentration, of mobile charge carriers, that means the doping level is not too high. Now, in principle, it happens the same. The family levels will equilibrate. However, due to the much smaller concentration of mobile charge carriers in the semiconductor, an extended space charge will develop. And in this picture, the colors of the energy bands uh, of the band, of the conduction band, the valence band, is now varying with the electrical field. If this gets more positive from the surface of the bike, it goes downwards, but the negative goes upwards. And uh, that, but the difference in the potential thus at the surface, close to the surface, in the range of the, that we have the hand of the metal, is very, very small, and in many cases can be approximated as negative. So this, this is the main difference. We have always a large space there, and the consequence is that the energy levels of the semiconductor in contact with the electrolyte are mainly controlled by the chemistry and not so much by the applied water in the case of the metal. Now, this picture shows uh, the comparison in terms of the double layer, the metal the Helmholtz double layer, in case of a semiconductor, an extended space charge layer, and have chosen in this size a system where the mobile majority carriers of the semiconductor, these are the electrons in the inter material, are removed from the surface by this charging. And uh, the excess charge consists now of immobile donors, ionized donor states. Uh, and this extends more and more, so higher the voltage difference. In principle, we have also the opposite situation, that depends on the type of bias we apply, that we can accumulate uh, charge in, again, as an example, an anti-semiconductor. That is a depletion layer, again, in another representation. 
these are the excessive ionized donors, and now the, uh, the, the spectrum that ends somewhere in the bulk, extended more and more, basically positive bias. But with negative bias, when we accumulate the mobile charge layers, then they become much more condensed, and we have a much less extended space charge layer. And if we go on and on, we finally approach the behavior of a matter. This can be uh, followed or can be analyzed in terms of a capacity, of the differential capacity, that means how much charge do you need for a small change in the voltage. And you can imagine if we have this depletion range where the space structure extends more and more, the capacity is controlled more or less by the distance between the surface and the end of the space structure layer, and one can derive that it decreases hyperbolically. The capacity would decrease hyperbolically. If you run into the accumulation, then finally the concentration of excess electrons on the surface becomes as large as that one approaches a metallic behavior, and then the capacity is controlled by the Hel a kind of Helmholtz double layer, very much like in the case of a metal. This part of the capacity uh, can be used for a determination of the zero point of charge. Uh, maybe the theory shows that it should follow the one over C squared, the vertical squared, uh, against what against the potential should give in the extrapolation the point where we have no excess charge on the surface that is called in the case of the semiconductors the flat band potential because then the energy of the band edges is flat from the bulk up to the surface. That's a well known uh, relation known from solid state physics and can be well verified also in the electrotechnical system. I am presenting here uh, measurements with uh, tungsten selenide electrode, n time in now uh, in non aqueous solvent. The reason that one has to use non aqueous solvent is just to have a larger range of polarization. And you see here, this is a measured curve, and this is very, uh, follows very ideally what you would expect. This is the vision range, and here you approach. Uh, capacity in the order of 7 micrometers per centimeter. And uh, for measurements made by Fawcett, there were the, the same uh, electrolyte measurements available for mercury. And you see, uh, that is a zero point of charge for mercury, which is adjusted to the same size scale. But the capacity in the very negative range, that we have a high uh, concentration of electrons as well as approaches comes very close to the value of mercury and it shows clearly that now we have practically a metallic behavior. The story is usually not as simple. And then it gives uh, uh, such a, as indicated by the fact that these kind of monotropic plots, the extrapolation of which gives us information about the zero point of charge, depends on the composition of the electron. Uh, for Kevin Sider, for example, the absence of a sulfide it is independent of the H, but the sulfide is dependent. And that is also a well known behavior for metals. You have, if you have specific absorption of ions, you change the zero point of charge. And this is practically the same. So, this such results indicate that sulfide ions are, are in some way specifically absorbed on the surface of sulfides. And a very common feature, there's a very common feature for oxides, uh, where protons or H minus ions uh, interact with the surface of oxide, which is maybe to some extent hydrolyzed into hydroxide. And uh, here are, uh, not, here are not, uh, such uh, uh, the causes of flatbed potentials. It depends on pH, and you see also another effect. The fact that potential depends obviously on the orientation of the crystal surface. Again, that is obvious because the fact that potential 
is related uh, to the uh, work function of materials. The work function depends on the crystal orientation. Now, this leads to a somewhat modified picture of the charge distribution on such a system. Let us begin here with the depletion wave. Depletion, but we can have charge on the surface, particularly in form of absorbed ions, which compensate part of the space charge. And even at the flat of potential, we have no space charge. And that is what we can measure. We can have such a charge distribution at the interface in a very narrow range uh, dimension of the uh, where we have absorbed ions and the counter charge in the electrolyte. And maybe we, have, we may even have charge on surface state. I shall not uh, discuss uh, today the role of electronic surface states, uh, but you see the situation becomes, in any case, much more complicated. Now, in rare cases, a surface behaves so uniformly as that which I showed you for tungsten selenide. Tungsten selenide is a layered material, and you can really produce a very smooth, ideally smooth surface. Uh, if one uh, uh, does such experiments with gallium arsenide or gallium phosphide, uh, then uh, um, on the first look you would not expect that the position of the flat level is the H dependent. However, it is a common feature that it is so, and that means that obviously the surface has a different chemical composition. It has obviously some oxide layer, maybe only a monolayer of oxygen, of chemical oxygen, and this surface interacts now with uh, water, this pH, uh, makes this pH dependent. That's a very common feature. So, uh, and it's not surprising because uh, if we would have a real clean surface of these materials, now in this simplified model we have dangling bonds on the surface, uh, unpaired electrons, which are certainly much more reactive than the electrons in the bulk, in the energy bands, and they will react with water, maybe in this way it's certain here, uh, just forming a mixed uh, hydroxide, hydroxide surface, and you know, it's according to the thermodynamic uh, 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 properties, might form finding an oxide layer instead of hydrogen. Uh, so we, have, we must conclude, and that is in some uh, respect maybe even fortunate, that most of the dangling bonds under normal conditions will be saturated, will have reacted with some reagents, and in this way the surface becomes more inert than it would be in the ultra high vacuum apparatus. Uh, but the interaction with electrolyte is in these cases controlled by the surface composition and no longer by the bulk composition. Now, I mentioned already not all surfaces are so ideal and uh, uh, particularly uh, if you have very different, uh, 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 different electronic properties for different uh, surface orientations, you should expect that you see these differences in the interaction with the neighboring electrolyte. Uh, good examples of these are the layered materials, and, example, and, and this is a structure which uh, uh, we have been used uh, for molybdenum side, molybdenum cellulite, tungsten side, tungsten cellulite are the materials which are used for such studies, where we have layered of uh, the Schalkut genes. Uh, surrounding the transition metal, and the bonding is usually such that we have uh, between the B states and the P states these strong bonds, and it turns out that the highest occupied levels in the valley band are usually non bonding or states or little bonding states, uh, in this case, uh, these uh, square. Uh, and uh, these uh, states are 
relatively well shielded by the surrounding layers, so they are not very reactive, even if they are, there are electrons missing in them. But you can imagine if we have an edge or different orientation where these electronic orbitals can interact with the surrounding. That will be a very different uh, situation. This will be a very different situation. And again, this shows up in uh, the interaction of such surfaces with uh, the ambient in case where we have species which are strictly strongly absorbed on such a surface if they find the right uh, size on the surface where the, the electrons can interact with these uh, orbitals uh, of, uh, in, in the solid. And you see, in a smooth iron line, as such, uh, an iron, uh, on a smooth surface, there is very little variation of the flat pepper tendon zero button charge. However, if we have step surfaces or highly coated surfaces, then there is a very strong situation and a large shift in the negative direction, indicating that we have now a great deal of iodine ions absorb on the surface, increasing this increasing concentration, and this absorption of this occurs on such specific surface sites where these d uh, state, the orbitals of the transition matter uh, can interact with uh, the iodide. And uh, And these uh, states, obviously, in contact with uh, aqueous solutions, uh, interact also with ox with uh, hydroxide and form some kind of uh, chemical oxygen. And then you see, in this situation, there's also a strong pH dependence. Uh, uh, dependence. It is not there on the smooth surface. Again, showing the reactivity of these particular sites. In the case of the present I died, uh, it's stronger result than the OH, and uh, so we have practically no pH dependence. Now, so we see uh, one can learn quite a bit from such an element on the properties of these surfaces, and uh, one can also get some idea how this is correlated to the electronic properties of our solids. Now I come to the redox reactions. This was the oil system in equilibrium. Now we come to the redox reactions. Now you will know that in the case of a metal electrode, uh, redox reactions occur uh, by um, activation of the surroundings of the ions. Uh, and in equilibrium, we have an exchange practically around the Fermi level. Uh, but the majority of the loose pieces is a deeper energy, it has to be activated. The majority uh, to find the vacant sites, the majority of the oxide pieces is in the higher energy range, has to make it downhill to find occupied site electrons for the exchange that goes on the narrow energy range around the uh, Fermi level. Now, if we compare now uh, this situation, where uh, you are going to see where can we expect electronic change between uh, the electron and the electron. Now we have to follow the distribution of the states. Uh, the reduced states form some kind of Gaussian distribution, at least in most of the approximations which are accepted, and uh, the same for other species. So uh, and we need always a counterpart. Uh, the, in the metal, we have electrons up to the Fermi level, then there are the sharp the decrease of the occupation and then the no states, vacant states of holes in the uh, upper energy range. So we only wear these uh, occupants that overlap with this, we have exchange and vice versa. But you see, if you do the same with the semiconductor, and uh, it happens that now the Fermi levels and in the, are in this same range, uh, now this area is excluded from, from the exchange because there are no states available in the gap if we have gap, no gap in this position. And uh, electron exchange in the conductor would mean that we would 
Well, here in this direction, shape is obviously possible, but we have a very, very small number of electrons there. And uh, to have ejection, we have, we have to extend this scale. It's, it's, it's not in this picture. It, it goes much, much further. And there is a tiny uh, amount may, it, it, it may be ejected. But this exchange time will be very, very small in this situation. And we have, we have to consider two types of exchange currents, one in the unnatural band, the other in the valence band. And uh, this depends very much on the relative position of the band edge of the semiconductor to the energy states in our redox system. Now, uh, if we take one particular semiconductor and compare it with different redox systems, that means if you have a redox system which is, has a rather negative redox potential, the states are up, uh, and so we have a good chance for electron exchange in the conduction band. If we have a, a very oxidizing redox system, states are down, we have a good chance for exchange in the valence band. And this is in between, we shall not expect any uh, electronic change at equilibrium. Now, uh, the systems which can easily be studied are those where the semiconductor is, has a high enough conductivity. So these are n-type or p-type materials. And the consequence is that with n-type materials, we can expect an uh, exchange uh, in the conduction band if the redox system is negative enough that we have enough overlap of the space in this range. And uh, if we apply a bias, uh, the consequence is that if we apply a positive bias, we remove the electrons from the surface. And that means now uh, only uh, those states which can inject charge into the uh, can contribute to the energy current. And that will be a constant, practically constant current, because that depends only on the energy difference between these states and the band edge, and just uh, on the activation needed. In the other direction, if we accumulate on then we have plenty uh, native states in the redox, and then the current goes uh, exponentially up. So we have a typical rectifying behavior for an the entire material, and this opposite behavior we must expect for a p-type material where we have in the cathodic direction this current limitation, in the inner direction and the accumulate towards an uh, exponential increase. Uh, one can express this, the kinetics of this, and the very the simplest approach is the assumption that for the, action, the conduction band, the uh, current in cathodic direction is proportional to the concentration of holes on the surface. And once we change with a bias, uh, that means this the band bending we apply by an external bias is this concentration. And that uh, follows the idea that it's such an exponential uh, correlation. Uh, so for actually the balance band, uh, it is the uh, energy part which is depending on the concentration of holes on the surface. And again, if we apply now a positive bias, it will increase exponentially. Uh, so you see, as a control of the reaction rate in the case of a semiconductor is not uh, with an, a bias applied does not occur by the evaluation of the activation barrier for charge transfer. It is the concentration of the reacting electronic species. So it is, in thermodynamic terms, the entropy factor which is changed by the applied bias, not the energy factor. Now, from such... Uh, um, uh, equation around uh, what expect. Current voltage curves that show an energy range practically constant 
income. In the case of the uh, high uh, exponential G, increased income, the rhythm is very linear, increasing up to the range where transport control takes over. And on first look, it appears that indeed uh, the theoretical approximations are fulfilled. Second look shows, however, that the slopes are not correct. They are smaller than expected. And it's still not yet quite clear what this means. It appears to me that the electrons, uh, in uh, most cases, have not really to go over the barrier. There are states uh, underneath the barrier where they can pass uh, by some uh, hopping or tunneling mechanism. And uh, there is an uh, indication for this that the slope is uh, uh, depending on the doping level, the highest doping level, so small on the slope. The idea is of 50, 60 millivolts, but uh, can only be reached at a very low doping level, where measurements are difficult because of the increasing resistivity. Uh, and uh, not always are such materials available in, uh, in, the, in this variation. And uh, the idea which can describe is that electrons have not to pass this day, they can tunnel through and certainly so more, uh, so uh, larger the catholic bias and less the endolic bias, so more they can pass there. So that is uh, just uh, showing that uh, even such systems don't behave as ideally as uh, uh, the, the simple theory tells you, but uh, the, in principle, it is, is uh, the main features are met by the theories. Now, I would like to show you some uh, examples where um, it could be uh, it could be shown that indeed uh, the energy position of these energy level solution control uh, the type of charge transfer and uh, one suitable possibility for checking this is the luminescence from the semiconductor in case of the injection of minority charge carriers. Again, let us uh, discuss it from interactivity because there are more time. Now, if we have uh, oxidized species in the uh, which has energy levels above the balance band, no whole injection is possible. That is will only go by electrons. Uh, from, and if you have enough electrons, they will find their way to the oxidized species. If we have this situation, where the object is uh, much more oxidizing and can inject colors, the question is, uh, if you have any kinds of the surface, do they react directly from the conduction band, or do they primarily react with injected holes? And if the latter is the case, you would expect that uh, now part of the recombination between electron holes might be radiative, and you might see luminescence, and that is indeed the case. Uh, these are curves here that show the relation uh, between the photocarbons, uh, between uh, the cathodic reduction carbons of sin 3, sin 3. Uh, in, again, in the non aqueous solution, we had to use non aqueous solvers in order to have enough polarizability and uh, stability of the system. Uh, and you see, uh, we have this uh, negative bias, that means if we decrease the band and increase the uh, concentration of electron on the surface, the current starts and we see, uh, we see the current uh, because mass time in electronic current. We don't know what is the mechanism. It could be direct reduction, it could be a commercial injected holes. If you go further, uh, luminescence is against. No, uh, this is not so in all cases. In other cases, for example, the same solution with uh, 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 um, uh, phenantrine. Uh, so the current uh, begins much earlier and the blessing comes much later. Now, what does this mean? 
Now, this one can the, uh, derive a correlation between the energy levels in the electrolyte and the semiconductor, uh, which are shown here. Then you get the sign C. The sign C really can be the eject holes, but uh, uh, let's say, uh, phenocytes we cannot. And that means if we have enough electrons, in the case of the side the injected holes react with the electrons, they recombine. At first, it occurs radiation is made by surface states, by surface recombination. That you cannot see. But if the uh, holes can escape into the bulk, we see luminescence from the bulk. Uh, we can see uh, luminescence from, or from this city, from this radar system only if we lift the band upwards. And this occurs if we accumulate so many electrons on the surface that now the Helmholtz double layer will be charged. And this uh, shows here the situation. Let us see the situation at a uh, voltage where uh, the, uh, we cannot yet inject holes, but by uplifting, that we that begins and then we see luminescence. So, uh, and the voltage drop we need for is in order to see the luminescence corresponds very well to the difference in the redox potentials. Uh, so, so much about the redox reactions. Now I am coming to photo reactions. It's uh, easy to see why uh, semiconductors are so much more adapted to show photoreactions than metals. If we absorb light in a metal, what happens? Now we get excited states, but the lifetime is extremely short because to very intensive electron electric action, the energy is very quickly dissipated and so the energy is lost. Because of a semiconductor, we have a much higher lifetime of the carriers, they must uh, meet each other again for recombination, and so therefore they have a much better chance to reach the interface in an excited state. And so you would expect electrons uh, react uh, performing photoreduction, holes performing photooxidation. Now we can uh, uh, we can separate these processes in a very simple way just by applying a bias to this. If we apply a positive bias, then the uh, 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 turn, uh, 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 turning the electrons to the bike, drawing to the bike, and uh, pushing the holes to the surface, and vice versa. And in this way, Photocurrents can be generated, uh, and again, the photocurrents are generated particularly under the situation of uh, depletion of the surface, because only in this case we have this uh, high field of the surface which separates electron hole pairs. And here is the situation for photooxidation by poles, and uh, here. In an n-type material, here see them for reduction by electrons in a p-type material. This uh, has a consequence that photocurrents will only be found or may be found in the under uh, at a bias where we have the depletion of the majority carriers. If the majority carriers increase uh, on the surface, then the uh, majority carriers are repelled from the surface, and the change in uh, concentration of the majority will be very, very small or negligible. And that means in impact material, we have practically no photocarbon uh, it negative bias, but the high photocarbon are positive bias, and if you reach the plateau, uh, then the photocarbon is saturated, that means uh, the quantity yield is controlled, 
by the penetration length of the light and by the diffusion length of the minority carriers. For a p-type it is the opposite. We have now photocurrents at cathodic bias, no photocurrents at endodic bias. Um, the photocurrent voltage curves uh, depend in this range where we have this increasing part very much on surface properties. That is again understandable uh, because the loss of the general alcohol pairs occurs by recombination. Some recombination will always occur in the bulk. But in most cases, the surface is, has a much higher rate of recombination. And if this is the case, then we shall have a larger loss in the current as long as the minority case can reach the surface. And the consequence is that one has photocurrent voltage curves, which depend very much on the surface properties. For example, you need a rocket example, just to give an example. In a very uh, good surface, this small number of surface states are also states in the light goes through the surface in the spectrum layer. We have a very steep increase of the photocurrent, reach saturation very quickly. In other cases, with a distorted surface layer, it goes uh, increases much, much slower and one does not reach the saturation current because even in the bulk we have an increased recombination rate and shorter lifetime. Oh, sorry. Uh, this uh, picture should be essential. Uh, one can make a, a simple calculation in the saturation rate of the quantum yield and sees that it depends mainly on uh, two factors, namely the absorptivity, one over absorptivity is the penetration depth of the light, and on the diffusion length, that is mobility, time, the root of mobility uh, times lifetime of the minority carriers. And uh, the W is uh, the extension of the space charge layer if one assumes that in the space charge layer uh, no recombination occurs. So with this uh, yield, if one can measure this yield, uh, it gives us a possibility uh, to determine the diffusion length if the absorptivity is known. And the, opti the optivity is often known in semiconductors. I want to give you as an example a uh, measurement at gallium selenide. This is a p-type semiconductor. And here is the uh, absorptivity. It, uh, it's relatively small, as you'll see, it the surface, so therefore the light penetration is rather deep, and uh, the yield is, uh, is rather low, and in this range where yield is low, you, this formula is uh, well applicable, and so when, from this one gets the uh, uh, diffusion length in the order of 7 times uh, minus 5 centimeter. Mm. This, as an example, is another example I want to show you measurements of this gallium selenide. Gallium selenide is another layer, uh, it was already gallium selenide, it's a structure, it's a layered material, uh, where we have this uh, uh, hexagonal structure, uh, and uh, these are the selenium, and this uh, really is gallium, gallium 2 molecules embedded into selenium layers. And such crystals have a pronounced anisotropy, and this permits to measure photocurrents under several and different conditions uh, for different uh, absorptivities. The, opti the absorptivity on such, of such a material depends mainly on the orientation of the light. If you use polarized light, the absorptivity is uh, by the free, uh, by, by the free uh, the material. Uh, so uh, it depends on the orientation of the E vector, so the vector of the light. And uh, it turns out that if the vector of the light is parallel to the principal axis of the crystal, these are the layer planes, so the normal to this, then we have a higher absorptivity than it is normal to the 
the C axis. And the consequence is, you know, we can uh, limit from the side plane if one is there, or from the layer plane. On the layer plane, uh, is it, it's, it's only one color of it. It's a normal beam. Uh, here we have so the normal beam in this direction and so the extraordinary, extraordinary beam in the other direction. And you see here, the photogram yield depends indeed very much on this orientation. Uh, and this curve with the highest yield is uh, obtained with the same light beam with the, uh, to a normal to a, on the side plane with the uh, E vector polarized parallel to the C axis with the highest parallel corresponding to the higher absorptive coefficient. So from this difference one can see uh, what uh, might be the difference in uh, diffusion lengths in these two orientations. Now, so much about these, uh, uh, just as an example for applications of such measurements. And now, finally, a few words on the energy conversion system. Now, I think you may have heard this last year from Professor Bart. It was one of his main subjects, I think. Uh, so, just to remind you that the electrochemical solar cell is based on the fact that in contact with a redox system, with suitable redox systems, semiconductors may form a depletion layer. And this condition is that at flat level potential, the Fermi level is above the redox Fermi level in solution. That would be the equilibrium situation here, this broken lines. Strong band bending, if you eliminate now, the, there is a counter voltage developed and the uh, bands are flattened, and this, for this counter voltage is the difference between the Fermi levels under illumination, the so called quasi Fermi levels, and the Fermi levels at rest, which co is, uh, corresponds to the equilibrium with the counter electrode. And this difference is the counter voltage that can be used for work. This is for an interferometry, for a peer interferometry, it's opposite. You need a radar system which forms here in the addition area for holes, so it must be more negative. Now, the system operates uh, on the right foot, like in this way, that the photo voltage used is consumed in some consumer and does the work there, and so that is the type of photovoltaic cell. And in ideal cases, uh, the change in the radar system, which is oxidized at this entropy table, would be just compensated by a reduction of the radar system at the counter electrode. And this would mean, in a real case, that nothing happens to the electrolyte. It should go on forever. Unfortunately, this surface usually has some side reactions with the holes. We get to the hole, and then uh, you run into a mess. And one of the great problems with difficult is how to, to learn how to prevent this corrosion. That is a real difficulty for the application of such systems, which on first look appear so simple and ideal. Uh, now, some photogram, some photogram characteristics show that they are not bad in the ideal cases, but they are really idealized systems uh, obtained only in, uh, uh, for a short period of time in most cases. And, uh, not with a real device, usually with relatively small electrodes. Now, uh, I will not go into further details of this uh, business business. You may know that the interesting goal would be just to generate directly a fuel which can be stored like hydrogen by water splitting. However, that is a very, very difficult task and it seems to be that it is, we have not uh, no material which really can do this in an efficient way. Uh, so I think that should have given you some survey about what, uh, what can be done in semiconductor electrochemistry, uh, a little bit also what the problems are. There are many more than I could mention, you, uh, you can imagine, uh, uh, but uh, I think the study of semiconductors has led uh, in the last 25 years, I would say, to much better understanding of the reactivity of electrodes. 
uh, even if these are, have this module character, I think uh, one has learned a lot. And in many cases of meta electrodes, you will have surface layers which are not such ideal semiconductors, but have properties which are related to the semiconductors. And therefore, I think it's important to understand these systems, even in uh, academic, uh, even if they are, have at present mainly academic value. Now, I think I, the, I had a transparency with the names of my co-workers, which I maybe I should write down. Uh, because I didn't want, it's only one transparency, it was not necessary to have a projector for this. Uh, but uh, I want to show you two pictures of our institute. Uh, now, one picture, it's very old. Uh, <laughs> that was, this was founded in 1912. And uh, these institutes, uh, these two institutes you see here, is the Kaiser Wilhelm of Chemistry and of Physical Chemistry. They are really the first institute of the Kaiser Wilhelm Gesellschaft, built in Berlin, in this area. And our institute, on the uh, right-hand side, is the only one which still does exist from this time. The other building uh, in front, uh, left, uh, still also exists, is the institute where Otto Hahn has worked. But it now is part of the Free University of Berlin, and no longer part of the Max Planck Gesellschaft, which uh, is, the heir, is the heir of the Kaiser Wilhelm Gesellschaft. And uh, that time when it was built, uh, it was open land, rather far apart from the center of Berlin. Uh, now it is some, a little bit different, but uh, it has not too much changed, as you will see here uh, from this picture, that's the present situation. Unfortunately, it's difficult to get an air picture because that is that can only be done by the American uh, helicopters, and <laughs> it could not let manage to get a flight with, <laughs> by them. So, and finally, uh, I could not. Could you have the lights, please? Is there some shark? No. Oh, it's stupid. Then I should read the names. I think those uh, results I have presented here uh, are mainly due to the work of. Uh, my former and some of my present co-workers, it was Jens Gobrecht for some, Wolfgang Kautek, another, both have left in the meantime, Hans-Joachim Leverenz, who is now in the Herrn Malte Institute in Berlin, Mrs. Uh, Margot Lübcke, it's my technical assistant, and she's very, very good, and uh, uh, replaces many graduate students <laughs> over the years. <laughs> also, she has no degree. <laughs> And uh, Dr. Robert McIntyre is a guest. He has done most of the work in the non aqueous solvents. And uh, Mr. Bernhard Smandek, who is just working for his PhD. Thank you for your attention.